Connected Nation mission uh, is to uh, help expand the uh, broadband frontier, in other words, to bridge the digital divide. Um, we understand this to be two things. Um, for us, uh, this challenge is one that is it's a supply side challenge as well as a demand side challenge. By supply side, I mean uh, making broadband infrastructure available to all Americans or to all citizens, depending on, we mostly work in America, so um, that's obviously a key challenge. Um, you need this infrastructure um, in order to be able to participate in, in, the, in the information technology a revolution that is taking place in front of us. Um, that is clearly a challenge that today, at least in America, is more of a rural challenge. Uh, that does vary by state, and there's certain areas of America, such as, for example, the Navajo nations and other such uh, 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 Native American nations uh, that, that really have a huge challenge. Uh, but even across uh, uh, many other parts of America that are rural in nature, uh, the challenge remains large. Uh, Clearly, the market has reached far and far, far and beyond, uh, but we still have some of those households, that last 5% of homes, that is pretty tough to build a business case, a solid business case for private investment. That's our challenge. Um, the other side of the challenge, that demand side challenge, is one that we actually, uh, from the very beginning, understood was, was going to be the key to our success, um, which was to uh, focus on adoption. In other words, to, to really... Um, realize the benefits for the society and the economy of this new technology. We don't just need big pipes, we need people to use them. And we need people to use them in more constructive ways. And so our challenge was very much focused on that. And obviously, this is a market that indeed works and is highly competitive in, 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 in many chunks of it, uh, not way out there in the boonies, but in many. The, the, clearly, the two problems are interlinked. One of the things, as we were confronting the first challenge, as a non-for-profit working with state government and the private sector, how can we entice private investment into a state? Uh, clearly, uh, the best way to do that, uh, we found, was to showcase that there's more pent-up demand than perhaps private investors and private business analysts might have thought uh, from their original assessments. Um, and clearly, this is a very sophisticated uh, market. There's companies such as Verizon that know how to do their homework. But what we have found is that particularly in rural areas, um, that our work in trying to uh, showcase that very uh, phenomenon actually does entice action, actually does um, uh, a, a become a catalyst for private investors to take a second look at communities. The founding founders of our country knew the importance of access to information for political, social, civic, and economic development. I mean, you've got jo Thomas Jefferson with information is the currency of democracy. They also knew the importance of the library. You had Thomas Jefferson, who was informed by his own special library, um, which he subsequently donated to Congress because they really needed one, um, and we still have it. And then we also had Benjamin Franklin's library, which informed the First Continental Congress. Um, and what I really like was he developed it in a way that made the common tradesmen and farmers as intelligent as most gentlemen from other countries. So we already sort of were sort of looking within um, and looking beyond. So I feel absolutely that if Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin uh, were around today, they would be at the forefront of public access computing and the internet. Um, both recognize the importance of using the most current technologies um, in promoting and maintaining a democracy. And their philosophy has carried through to the present. So this is, there is, I'm trying to give a little bit of the government interest in the role. Um, uh, our agency, I think our authorizing legislation is, is beautiful, which is that democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. It must therefore foster and support a form of education and access to information and ideas designed to make people of all backgrounds and wherever located masters of their technology and not its unthinking service. So the sort of role in making sure that everybody has access, and that, that particular sentence dates back to 1965. So our, our library programs actually date back to the 1950s, and they actually started 
um, to provide library services in rural areas and stimulate state and local investment and private investment, actually. Um, uh, because th the problem was and strikingly similar today that, that was, those were the areas with a lot of the, the greatest needs. Um, ten years later, services extended to urban communities, to individuals with disabilities, and then the development of services for Native American tribes. Um, but the whole idea was to develop a network of library services throughout the nation to make sure that people had access to information and education. Um, in the United States, we actually now have approximately 123,000 libraries. So that's, that's our goal. Um, and just a, a kind of a connection here, the Telecommunications Act, which established the E-rate program, um, Universal Services, actually provides the discounts through the library system that was developed through the Library Services Act. So there's sort of a government role here, but I think that it shows the importance of ensuring that people have access, but also where the government tries to stimulate uh, investment or, or growth in areas that might, not that might need a little extra encouragement. So for the last 10 years, we've, we've taught this Global Graduate Seminar. That's what we call it, the Global Graduate Seminar on Disability and Development. And the universities involved were American University here in Washington, D.C., uh, Howard University here in Washington, D.C., also the University of Michigan, and then when I moved to Syracuse University, it was also Syracuse involved. Um, so, you know, all of these are uh, advanced research universities, some urban, some rural, uh, if you want to call Ann Arbor uh, rural. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right, that's right. So, uh, yeah, I, I noticed I didn't mention that. Uh, I'm still employed at Syracuse uh, uh, in American <laughs> University. I live in Washington now. Uh, but, um, but the universities in, in, um, in South Africa were also a mix of urban and rural. So we had the university. I'm glad my colleague uh, Nanette Levinson, Professor Levinson, has come back because she and I worked on this for 10 years and have been writing about it a lot. Um, so the universities in South Africa were a combination of both urban and rural um, as well. So we had the University of the Vivatasran in Johannesburg. We had the University of Pretoria in Pretoria. And the University of Fort Hare, which is in Alice, South Africa, which is in a very uh, rural uh, province in South Africa. It's in the largest province of South Africa, but the poorest province in South Africa. But it's an historic university. It's where Nelson Mandela went to university. It's where Robert Mugabe went to university. So it's a very rural, isolated uh, university. And the idea was, how could we build human capacity at a distance? How could we understand that all of the knowledge resources you need at any given time won't be physically at the same place at any given time? For example, Eden Katz, one of our, um, uh, uh, what do we call them, first responders, is a, is a tremendous knowledge resource for this panel, but he couldn't be here physically. And so that was part of our, our question is when you have all these knowledge resources that exist around the world, how do you get them um, together to work together uh, even if they're not physically in the same place? And so the model that we took for that is um, a model of a collaboratory. And I pro promised one of our co-organizers, Garland, that I would, uh, would, would explain what a, collaboratory, uh, what a collaboratory is. So we came to collaboratories when we think about the kind of skills that are required. So again, once you get access, what kind of skills are required in this kind of globally distributed environment? So one of the key skills that we argue is whether you're in government, private sector, universities, scientific researchers, civil society organizations, is that increasingly one of the skills you need is to be able to work in global virtual teams. You need to be able to work with people who are not physically in the same environment with you. Uh, so this requires uh, working across time zones, working across cultures, working across different kinds of technologies, becoming comfortable with using the technologies, not just as toys, but as tools to be able to enable the kind of work uh, that you'd like to do. Being able to work across disciplines, so people that are not in the same uh, academic discipline with you or the same organizational type, and various types of organizations, um, whether it be government organizations, working with private sector organizations, so really representing the, the IGF spirit of working in this multi-stakeholder environment. Thank you.